opinions voiced in this program are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, and financial advisor or tax advisor prior to investing. Securities are offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA SIPC. Good morning, and welcome to Beyond the Business, brought to you by the College of Charleston School of Business. The College of Charleston School of Business, where students are beyond ready to work, they're ready to make an impact. Each Saturday morning at 9, successful business leaders and entrepreneurs from across the Lowcountry talk about what it takes to succeed in business and in life. Now your hosts of Beyond the Business, Eric Cox and Leslie Haywood. And great Saturday morning, Low Country. Welcome to another edition of Beyond the Business, heard here on 94.3 WSC and simulcast on iHeartRadio. You might be checking us out via our podcast on Spotify or iTunes. Again, Beyond the Business, presented by the College of Charleston School of Business, where students are beyond ready to work. They're ready to make an impact. I'm your host this morning, Eric Cox, with the lovely and talented Leslie Haywood. Good morning, Leslie. Good morning. Good morning, Eric, and good morning, Low Country. Hope you are having a pleasant morning. And make sure and follow us beyond Saturday mornings and come see us on our Facebook page at Beyond the Business or talk to us on Twitter at BTBCHS. How Hard are things going over there? Yeah. What, uh, what, what day is it? it? It's it's December, Leslie. It's December. It's hard to believe that. Uh, I think we're all ready for December to come and December to go and turn the page on 2020. Uh, but you know what? COVID, whatever you want going on, we, we don't stop the show. It, beyond the business continues, right? Right, right. And actually, that's the most interesting thing about, I, I swear, what's going on in the world that in, we've been able to expand our reach bes- you know, from local entrepreneurs to international entrepreneurs, uh, that like which leads us right into what happened last week. Yeah, what a great show! And uh, we had a first. You know, six and a half years of doing Beyond the Business. We had a first last week, and that was to be able to broadcast uh, from an entrepreneur overseas. And we had Yarun Court out on the show. And I know I completely messed his name up again, but Yarun was great. Um, he's a co-founder of Salesflare, which is a um, uh, intelligent CRM for business to business. And uh, Yurun was coming to us from Antwerp, Belgium uh, last week and the week before, which was pretty incredible just to a, have such great quality of, of communication, but to hear his story and certainly kind of a different flair from an international perspective. Um, I know you had a couple of nuggets that you took away, Leslie. What would be a highlight? Well, it, it was just funny. It struck me how even though Yurun is a Belgian a Belgium entrepreneur with a Belgian company, and he actually spent very little time here in the U.S., but his stories and struggles and the things that he went through were the very same things that we hear from our local entrepreneurs. Like, for example, you've got to hire the right people. Money is always an issue. Self-care is important. It's just I just found it really interesting that the entrepreneurial successes and failures seem to be the same regardless of what accent you have, what language you speak, and what side of the you live on. So it was it was fun to see that, that we're all <laughs> all entrepreneurs, we're all in it together. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And none of us sheltered from the twists and turns of entrepreneurship. That's for sure. So um, no doubt he had a, a great show. Um, and I know um, really talking about his trip to the United States, right? He came to Vegas and met his business partner and how all that unfolded. And um, as they say, all great things come out of Vegas, right? So uh, (laughs) if if you happen to miss that show, don't fret. You can go check it out again on Spotify or iTunes. Simply put in Beyond the Business, or you can go to our website at CoastalWM.com and click on that radio icon. And you can check out Yaroon's show as well as all of our shows from the last six, six and a half years. And now we're going to go from Antwerp, Belgium, all the way back over to Florence, South Carolina, which is exciting. Uh, We're really excited to have our guest on today. And uh, first of all, we just want to introduce Rick Saunders. Rick is the president and CEO of First Reliance Bank. Uh, Rick, good morning to you. Good morning, Eric and Leslie. Thank you for having me. Well, we're excited to have you on. And again, as Leslie mentioned, because of COVID and doing all this remotely, we have the opportunity to, again to bring uh, you know entrepreneurs on from not just here in the Low Country, but we can spread our horizons. And so uh, we're we're touching base in Florence today. We're excited to have you on. Looking forward to hearing uh, certainly your life story. But if you don't mind, Rick, real quick, give a you know twenty thirty second commercial on First Reliance so those uh, folks listening know who they're talking to or listening I'm, to today. I'm happy to. I, I will tell you that before uh, before I do that. I, 
had the opportunity to go back and uh, look at some of the previous episodes of your show, and you've had some quite impressive business people, and I feel honored to be part of such an uh, outstanding group of people. So from Belgium to Florence, that's a pretty big jump. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how I should feel about that. But anyway, I'll do my best to uh, to be informative and keep you reasonably in, in, entertained. So, so look, banking is an interesting uh, business. Um, I tell people that there are only a handful of professions in the world who um, who have the opportunity to really make a very deep, impactful difference in people's lives and and you know whether you're a first responder or or a pastor or in the medical field or a teacher possibly you know bankers bankers are often seen uh, 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 differently than that but but we're we're the source of of capital that allows people to buy homes and send uh, children to school and start businesses and to uh, be advisors on on how to prepare for retirement and to achieve whatever financial goals that you may have. So it's an opportunity to impact people in a very direct, very direct way. So I, I, I tell people we sell the same things everybody else sells. We sell deposits and we sell loan products. Um, Uh, And I often remind people that when we established this company, uh, we established a strategic statement that we try never to veer from. And and that statement is, there's more to banking than money. And and we often think about banking as a, a net sum of just dollars and cents. And there's more than that. And I try to remind my staff and I often remind my customers that the best price and the best deal aren't always the same thing. So... Uh, work real hard to not commoditize what we do. So the difference is for us is that we're we are a community bank. We are headquartered in Florence. We're regional in, in that we are in every major market in South Carolina and in North Charlotte and Winston Salem, North North Carolina. We founded the company 21 years ago um, because we felt like that uh, there was a place for community banks. I really felt like at the time that I wanted a place where people enjoy working and customers enjoy banking and that everybody who invested in that process benefited from it. And and here we are 21 years later, uh, and I'm still the CEO of the company, so they haven't run me off yet. We employ 170 people. About 50 of those are in Charleston, by the way. So a large portion of our staff is, head, is a headquarter right there in Charleston, although our, our formal corporate headquarters are here in Florence. So I'm in Charleston an awful lot. I consider that as much my home as, as, as Florence just because because we have so much invested in, in that community. Well, I cannot wait to hear how that whole uh, journey of yours unfolded, but like we do every week, and um, we're going to start way, way, way back. So we need to see what what made the, the man Rick w- based on his childhood. So Rick, tell me about your um, where you were born, your family life, your upbringing, brothers and sisters. Well, it sounds like I'm going into therapy, Leslie. Yeah, uh, no, I know. I'm like, I'm at Barbara Walters of radio. <laughs> yeah, so, so we're going to get deep. I'll try not to I, make you uh, cry. I, I have a uncomplicated, um, normal life. My father and mother are, were born and raised Sumter residents. Um, my father ran a gas company in Sumter, and, and I was born in Sumter, South Carolina, in a very early age. Uh, we moved to Timminsville, South Carolina, which is just a, a small community just outside of Florence, where he ran the gas company his entire c- career there. My mother uh, worked for a family-owned community bank right there in, in Timminsville. It ultimately was the bank I spent most of my career outside of this this company where we started. Uh, so, you know, so I had a little bit of banking uh, exposure, not that that influenced my desire to, to be a banker. I'll tell you about that process in a little bit. It's kind of weird how I fell into banking. But I have two brothers. One of my brothers uh, was the co-founder of this organization with me. So he and I founded the company together along with one of our very good friends, Dale Porter, who's now now retired. And I have a, a another brother uh, who is a personal trainer. Um in Tucson, Arizona. He was in the Air Force at, uh, right out of school, and they dropped him off in Arizona, and he said, this is a really cool place. I'm never coming back to South Carolina, so he, he stays out there all the time. But he has a quite successful 
um, uh, training business where he helps people achieve their physical goals. So my brother and I are bankers, that's all we know how to do. If I couldn't be a banker, I probably would have to uh, uh, pick up trash for a living or something because I don't know that I have a skill set or anything outside of, of what we do. So I, I'm married to my, my wife, Tiffany. Uh, we've been married 23 years. We've been together 25. Uh, we have four children. Um, uh, one of those was from my first marriage, and, 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 and he's a great kid. He worked for the company a little while, but he's a technologist here in Florence for the hospital system. And then, of course, I've got an 18-year-old daughter who is a freshman at College of Charleston. And uh, I have a 17-year-old son who says that he's going to the College of Charleston, too. Uh, he's, he's got eight applications out to colleges right now, so I don't know if he knows what he wants to do. Mm-hmm. And I have a 12-year-old girl um, that, that everybody thinks is my granddaughter uh, because mm-hmm. there's such a just big disparity in my age and, 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 and hers. Uh, both the girls are booked in uh, um, uh, uh, in that the – Reagan and, and Riley both are, are Chinese. We adopted them from China. Uh, interesting that that we adopted Reagan. We were the last family into China during the SARS epidemic before they got it under control. And she left our home to be a college freshman in, in the COVID uh, era. So she's booked wow. in her entire life with us on, on pandemics. Um, but wow. it was such an amazing experience. We decided to go do it again and, and ended up with, with Riley. And in between, Ree was born. The doctor said we would never be able to have a baby. And and um, and sure enough, he shows up. He was born a month before we left for China to go get Reagan. So they're almost twins, not in age, but in time. So, so, so got- I'm going to go back to your childhood for a minute. Um, so go back to kind of like when you were that age. When you were your kids' ages, what were you like as a kid? What were you like as a teenager? And what was your thoughts and dreams of what you wanted to be when you grew up? So I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. I will tell you, my father, um, my father, uh, father passed away when he was a young teenager. So my father started working a, a as a in a career when he was a teenager and only knew that the importance of hard work and all, you know, so when I was 14, he shows up and says, uh, do you think you can want to own a car when you're 15? I said, absolutely. He said, well, follow me. And he took me up to the local grocery store and said, how about I give him a job? He needs to buy a car in a year. And I remember I made a dollar and 10 cents an hour bagging chickens in the meat department of that, that store until I had enough money to, to buy a car. So my father was a big believer that you're, you're, you're up, you're up when the sun comes up and you're in bed early and you give a hard day's work at whatever job that you're doing. Uh, so he taught me one, the importance of hard work and how to be, how to be a good employee for people who, who put their trust in you to put you on their payroll. Uh, but naturally uh, I just, uh, I was always an extremely rebellious a uh, child, I was every parent's worst nightmare. So if you See, said, these are the good stories. <laughs> yeah, if you said, let's turn right, I was saying, well, why can't we turn left? I want to go left. If you're saying, let's go left, I'm saying, well, I think I want to go right. I was that kind of teenager. Um, but because of that, I had a natural uh, a drive to be very competitive and to always push envelopes. I guess at that early phase of my life, I may have Maybe it was early formation of being an entrepreneur and what it was like to be creative in your mind and thinking that somebody can build a fence around you and set a boundary, but maybe there's a different boundary and a different fence or a different hill to always push and climb. And I don't know that at 15 and 16 and 17 that I knew that was what was going on, um, but that's how I operated. So, you know, I, I, I always wanted to win and I was always just average in capability. So because my for instance, I was very athletic. I played a lot of athletics. Let me say I was not athletic. I was reasonably okay, but because I was so competitive, I always excelled. And and I've learned that you can be average in intellect and average in capability, but if you have a deep desire to excel and win, you can develop mediocrity into something that's pretty outstanding. And and I learned that at an early age. I don't know that at, at 16, I think, well, this is a good lesson to apply when I'm I'm 60. Uh, but it certainly proved itself to be the case. So I, uh, I went off to college and and uh, had no idea even then what I wanted to do for a living. So I spent, well, for instance, I went to college on a football scholarship, got injured and lost the scholarship. My family couldn't afford to send me to college. So I was walking down the hall one day saying, OK, I'm going to have to leave. And they were trying out for a mixed 
singing group and they needed a bass singer and i said well i could sing a little bit so i went in and tried out and got the singing gig and traveled for two years on a full scholarship with this college but even then i didn't know what i wanted to do so i dropped out of college and um and and never went back so very few bank ceos at 60 uh can say i don't have a college degree um but because of that I always felt like that I had to work twice as hard and and study twice as much and and know twice as much, and that desire to be competitive and to win and that overcoming that lack of I got I don't have the piece of paper um, right. probably pushed me harder than, than than most people. So I would say that if you wanted to know me as a, as a young person, I was very rebellious, uh, but I was very competitive. And, uh, and those things, those traits have turned out to be uh, pretty good contributors to where I'm at at, at 60. Wow. I would not wish that on many parents, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you, that's what my husband and I say the same thing. All we hope is that our children are better than we were. And so far, so good. <laughs> so after you dropped out, I mean, what did your parents think about all of that? Were they disappointed? Were they, um, you know, the, the whole work hard? What did you do? So, you know, um, um, neither, neither one of my parents are, are college graduates either. It's mm-hmm. probably one of the reasons why they didn't have that deep influence on finishing school wasn't a big deal to to them um they couldn't afford to send me to college anyway so i was trying to figure it out on on my own as it was so i didn't get the okay i told you so kind of thing it was okay well go find a job and get to work you're off my payroll and i can't help you so right uh, i did that's exactly what i did so i i um i had a friend that told me about a job in the finance business and um i went in and, and applied got the job and I made a whopping seven hundred and fifty dollars a month, uh, which is still even back in that time. And that you're talking about 1980. Uh, that was still starving money then too. I don't think that was enough money to even hardly live even then. But I happened to have go work for a company, and I had two really great mentors in in that business, and they saw something in me, um, uh, and invested themselves in me. So I spent three years working for two amazing, amazing men. Uh, that really just kind of began changing the scope of my entire life from from that point. And, you know, I I, I really just took the job because I needed something to do. Uh, but a month into the job, I, I realized pretty quickly that I was I was naturally good at it. And because I didn't have the college degree and I was doing something that seemed to make a difference and I was reasonably good at it, I just said, well, I'm not going to bounce around. I'm going to invest in being the best I can be at this job. And that, that's part of the competitive side of me that says, OK, go get good at this. And. And I did. So I was always the first one in, the last one to leave. And I was always the one asking uh, where are the milestones and who do I need to be to be the best. And and I just happened to have the right place, the right time and the right mentors who kind of helped me propel myself from that and point. And what were you what were you doing at that time? Exactly. What was that? First so job? it was a it was a it was a finance company called Trans South Financial. Uh, they actually were, were lenders to low to moderate income people. Uh, so it was a different skill set than banking and that the, the, the demographic may be a little bit different, but the, but the concepts are the same in terms of how you lend money and how you make decisions and how you read people and, and, and how you, you do things that, that ultimately can impact somebody financially. So it was the formation of my early banking career, but it was done in a, not in a banking environment, in a financial, uh, financial services in, environment. So uh, it was, it was different, but it was done in Charleston. I lived in Charleston for a couple of years, um, three years and boy, every, every 20 year old, old man wants to live in Charleston. Right. So what a great time to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, be in a great city and have a great boss and working for a great company. And, and, uh, and they came in uh, one day and said, that, look, you know, it's, we're ready for you to go to the next level with our company. We want to uh, promote you to run an office. And and um, my mentor came to me then and said, look, I've, I've spent 40 years in this business. This is a hard business. Uh, you really probably ought to think about maybe getting into banking from this point. You've got what it takes to be successful in that world. Uh, I really think probably if you turn down this move and it was to another state and I was questioned, did I want to go to another state? But if you turn down this move, you know, your career is going to be stymied here. And frankly, I don't think you want to build a career in in the finance company business. You should be a banker. I think you're skilled enough to be a, a really good banker. So uh, uh, he helped me construct a resume and I applied to, to three banks. One of those banks was a family bank back here in, in Florence. 
um, and then two were national banks. And I got job offers from all three. Um, and and obviously, I preferred the family the family owned bank. It was familiar. It was back in my hometown, and and. The gentleman that that owned the company came to me and said, "I got a I got a problem. I want to talk to you about. Um, I've got six candidates. Five of these candidates have college degrees, and you don't have a college degree. Uh, help me understand why I should even consider you." I said, "Well, I can't speak to your other five candidates. I don't know them, but I can tell you I can hit the ground running day one, doing what you need me to do. You don't have to invest in training me or teaching me. I can do the job from day one. But I tell you what, I." I think I will do you a good enough job that I'm prepared to give you six months for free. You don't pay me for six months. And in six months, if you like my work, pay me for the back six months. And if you don't, you just wasted six months, but you haven't cost you a dime. Wow. And uh, he said, well, that's pretty gutsy for you to throw that out on the table. I said, well, I feel that good that I can come in and make a difference in your company. And, of course, he, he offered me the job. I got the job. Uh, uh, and it was because I was willing to take the risk, take the financial risk which we don't see a lot of that in business anymore. Um, um, everybody has a sense of entitlement, not a sense of, I'm a believe in, li- believer in labor before capital. You do the work and you do the work well, money will follow. Uh, and it, it should never really be about money. It should be about something bigger than that. But that's a different conversation. But anyway, he got me, gave me the job and, and I came in at the very bottom uh, of the of the pool uh, in terms of, of ranks. But at the end of the day, I spent almost 20 years with that company until they sold it. And uh, at the, when they sold it, I was on their senior team and I was on their board of directors and I had pretty much done every job in the bank. And I, I don't know at the time I appreciated the value of that education, but but there's not a job in a bank that in some time in my 40 year career I have not done and could perform pretty proficiently. So um, it set the tone for me being qualified to actually start my own bank one day, although I never had an ambition to, to do that. So as we're winding out our time here, Rick, give us a little insight, since this is a a show about entrepreneurship, where that seed of of entrepreneurship belief that, hey, I could now sort of jump out of somebody else's structure and and, go do this on my own. So so let me just qualify qualify first. Uh, I would encourage people never to chase the idea of being an entrepreneur because there's a chance to make a lot of money. Uh, I think sometimes the, the risk and the sacrifices that entrepreneurs have to make, uh, you can't make enough money to 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 take that on. Um, it's got to be about something bigger than that. And, and I'm a big believer in purpose and having a sense of purpose and, and the emotional connectivity to what you're doing and not just the financial connectivity. Money usually works itself out. Um, uh, but I've never made a, 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 an extra dime that brought an extra level of happiness to me. It was always ultimately about uh, improving myself and improving the people around me that were where I found real joy. So, look, here's the thing is that I went to work for this new company that bought the old company. And and it wasn't that we were where we're copying out of that. It was a big it was a big regional business. Um, they had twenty five hundred people on their sales force. By year number one, I was the second most profitable banker in that system, and my brother was the fourth most profitable banker in the system. So we weren't we weren't looking for an escape route to something we couldn't perform in. We were actually performing quite well in, in that world. And and what I began to realize is we um, and, and let me back up and digress a minute. Even when I worked for the old family-owned bank, I got job offers making double. Uh, to other companies and and always felt like that I was so aligned with the family and what they wanted to accomplish and that I got so much opportunity to learn that it was no money somebody could offer me that would take away from what I, the freedom I had and the, the autonomy I had and the the, the experiences I was, was gaining uh, working as, and not getting pigeonholed in a big company and stuck in a corner somewhere. So I didn't process all that at 30-something but, but but I think in, intuitively I knew that you couldn't offer me enough money to lead that environment. So when I got to work for this bigger company by default and we were performing very well, I realized pretty quickly that that every company has a set of values in the DNA of the culture of that company, whether they're on a piece of paper or not. Every company operates to a set of standards or set of values. And it ultimately exudes itself in its leaders and in and, 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 and the way they treat their employees and their customers and, and their stakeholders. 
And not to say that my way is better than their way, but my way is my way and your way is your way. And I started to begin to identify that that I thought that employees should be treated a certain way uh, and that customers should be treated a certain way. And this their way was different. And all of a sudden, I wasn't aligned with where leadership wanted to go. So it was back to my old days. They wanted to go right. I felt like I needed to go left. And now what I do. So the worst employer you can have is the one that, that quits emotionally but doesn't leave the payroll. And I didn't want to be one of those guys, right? So I wasn't going to be that guy who sat around and complained every day about the company and, and still collected their paychecks. I was going to go do my own thing. So my brother and I decided that that we would just package ourselves as the Saunders brothers and go find another community bank to go work for. And and um, and still didn't have the idea that we should go start something. Well, he comes in with a bright idea one day, says, our friend Dale and I have been talking, Rick, we want to start our own bank, but we can't do it without you as part of the team. Do you want to come do this bank with us? And I said, y'all have lost your minds. <laughs> Who goes out and starts a bank? Uh, we had no idea how to even begin the process. And I said, no, I'm not even interested in that. I'm, I'm comfortable going to work for somebody else. And and um, he said, well, if I can get you an audience with a guy who's done this a couple of times, would you take the audience if he'll listen to us? And we did. And sure enough, we talked to this guy. He convinced us it was the right thing to do. And boy, we were off to the races. So, yeah, 21 years later, here we are. Oh. And and what a great place to wind our show down. You, you're leaving our audience kind of on the cliff, which is what we want. So they have to come back next week and hear the rest of the story. So, Rick, thank you so much for sharing. Again, Rick Saunders, president and CEO of First Reliance Bank out of Florence. Uh, we look forward to having you back next Saturday morning. Perfect. And again, you've been listening to Beyond the Business, heard here on 94.3 WSC, presented by the College of Charleston School of Business and Coastal Wealth Management. And until next Saturday morning, Low Country. Have a blessed week.